Welcome to the speaker series panel as part of this year's Climate Tech and Energy Prize at MIT. My name is Sushmita, and I'm one of the co-managing directors this year, along with Peter McHale. This is our 14th annual competition where teams from across the world will have a chance to pitch for $100,000 in prize money toward your company that is working to tackle the numerous issues in climate technology and energy. While we've already received a number of excellent applications, you still have until Friday, February 5th to apply. We created this event today to inspire anyone who is considering applying, but perhaps needs some inspiration on where to start their business pr proposition. Therefore, we gathered four incredible people who work in sustainability focused roles to do research and who do research in the climate tech industry to present what they believe are the biggest challenges for startups to tackle in this space. Our panelists today include MIT professor and director of MIT Sloan Sustainability Initiative, Professor John Sturman, Professor of Innovation Strategy, Professor Jacqueline Pless, Google X Technology Scout, Tom Hunt, and Walmart Director of Strategic Initiatives, Elizabeth Willett Murchison. They will each speak for about 10 minutes and then we will open it up for Q&A after. So please feel free to write your questions to all of our panelists um, through, throughout the session um, using the Q&A function at the bottom. Hi everyone, my name is Robert Cunningham and I'm one of the applicant directors for this year's competition. First, we will hear from John Sturman, professor at MIT Sloan and director of MIT's System Dynamics Group and the MIT Sloan Sustainability Initiative. Professor Sturman's research centers on improving decision making in complex systems, including corporate strategy and operations, energy policy, public health, sustainability, and climate change. His work ranges from the dynamics of organizational change to the implementation of improvement programs and policies to promote a sustainable world. Professor Sturman is the author of many popular articles on the challenges and opportunities facing organizations today. His insight into climate change and energy policy have been featured in media around the world, including the New York Times, Washington Post, Boston Globe, and more. Professor Sturman, thanks so much for joining us. Well, thank you. I'm really delighted to be here and appreciate the chance to share a few minutes with you. Uh, of so I think the question that I was asked to address and that we're all asked to address is, where do we think there's major business opportunity for people in climate tech and especially for startups? So I think there are many, but the one I'd like to focus on tonight is energy efficiency and particularly energy efficiency in housing and especially for low and moderate income folks. So let me explain. First of all, I think you all know that in order to have any kind of decent chance to limit global warming to no more than two degrees C, which is 3.6 Fahrenheit above pre-industrial levels, we have to cut global greenhouse gas emissions by 50% or so in the next 10 years, and then bring it to zero by mid-century, possibly with negative emissions after that. And of course, two degrees C, 3.6 Fahrenheit, that's not safe. It's just less harmful to us, to our prosperity, our health, and our lives than where we are today at a little over one degree C above pre-industrial or about two degrees Fahrenheit. So even more important, those of us who are fortunate enough to live in the developed world, like the United States, we're gonna to have to cut our emissions even faster and more deeply than that global average reduction I just mentioned, because we know that the countries in the developing world have not pledged under the Paris Agreement that we're about to rejoin uh, to cut their emissions anywhere near that 50% mark. In fact, many of them are planning to grow their emissions for years to come. So we have to cut even more than that. So how are we gonna do it? Well, we, we have to cut everywhere in every sector of the economy, but residential and commercial buildings in the United States together are nearly a third of our total global, of our total greenhouse gas emissions and residences alone are about 16%. There's 125 million units of housing in this country. We're adding a percent or so to that stock every year, but what this means is to have any decent chance of getting where we need to go, we have to dramatically cut the emissions 
from our residential building stock. And that means retrofits to existing structures at the same time, we're dramatically increasing the energy efficiency of new buildings. So how can that be done? And how could that be done in a way that would make it an interesting opportunity for startups in clean tech? So I think there's a lot of ways that that can happen. First of all, the average home in the United States is, uh, is very inefficient compared to the most efficient homes or the typical home that's being built today. If we could retrofit existing buildings just to the level of the typical new home that's built, it would cut residential energy use by 25%. But of course, that's not the standard because the typical new construction in this country is extremely inefficient compared to what's possible profitably and to what's been demonstrated in this country and other parts of the world, including the passive house standard from Germany and net zero construction of all, all kinds all around. So what would it look like? It would look like a deep energy retrofit using integrated design and a whole systems approach. A lot of the retrofit activity that's happening today is piecemeal. You get an organization, whether it's public or private, to come in and do an energy audit and they'll tell you, oh yeah, you know, your windows are leaky. We're gonna, uh, we can weather strip those for you uh, or we can blow some insulation into your attic. That's not a whole system approach. And it leads to sharply diminishing returns to doing a little bit more, a little bit more, a little bit more. If you do a whole system integrated de design approach, you look at the entire building or even neighborhoods of buildings from a systems perspective. And what you will then find out is that very often, the more you do, the more reductions in cost you'll find. You cut your energy use a little bit, you still need your heating system. If you can cut it enough to get to passive house standards, you may not need a heating system at all. Think of the money that that saves. This is not theory. This has been done multiple times. Uh, and it's easy actually to get to zero net, even for existing buildings. So where I'm speaking to you right now, uh, my home uh, is uh, about 95 years old. It's a traditional stick framed uh, colonial revival style of home that you find in the Massachusetts area. And when we moved in here in 1990, it was grossly inefficient. It was heated by fuel oil, very little insulation, the original windows and so on. To keep a long story short, although we did a number of those piecemeal activities over the years to try to lower our carbon footprint, about five and a half years ago, my wife and I did a deep energy retrofit on this structure in the context of whole system design. And that meant bundling what we did with a renovation that quite frankly, it desperately needed anyway. Uh, so what did we do? Well, lots of extra insulation, including extra insulation on the outside of all the walls because the walls aren't thick enough as is typically the case in existing structures. New windows of much higher quality than would normally be put in or required by building code, et cetera. Uh, we completely ripped out the natural gas heating system and it's now an all electric home. So LED lighting everywhere, highly efficient appliances, heat pump uh, for heating and cooling, uh, induction cooktop, uh, heat pump, hot water, et cetera, and solar on the roof. And so over the past five full years of production experience that we've got, we have made 50%, almost 50% more energy than we have used which means that we now have no electric bill, no heating bill, no cooling bill. And uh, my electric utility owes us over $4,000, which we'll be able to use for electric vehicles or donate it to a worthy charitable organization. So it's possible and it's profitable, but here's the really important thing. This needs to be done for low and moderate income folks. Unlike MIT faculty, they don't have the financial resources, the access to credit, uh, et cetera, to be able to finance a project like this themselves. Many of the poor and disadvantaged in our society live in rental housing. And then that exposes you to the landlord tenant problem where if they pay, the tenants pay the utility bills, landlords have zero incentive to make the capital investment to upgrade energy efficiency. Even worse for many of the poor in our society, every winter, and I mean right around here within a mile of where I am, every winter, the poor and people on fixed incomes have to choose between heating and eating. That's unfair, that's unethical, 
that perpetuates systemic racism and discrimination and disadvantage. And it's not necessary, it can be fixed and there's tremendous opportunity for entrepreneurs to contribute to that solution. So what would it look like? It would look like solving the landlord tenant problem. That's not a technology issue. That's a question of how do you structure a model contract that your town or city could put out there that would enable landlords and tenants to quickly and less painfully negotiate gain sharing agreements that would enable those upgrades to be done. It looks like gaining access to lower cost capital for the owners and renters uh, of low and moderate income housing so that they can actually afford to put it in. There's lots of ways to do that. Pace financing, bundling, residential uh, town level solarization programs, et cetera. And most importantly, it means partnering with other organizations to be able to capture some of the co-benefits that arise from this kind of deep energy retrofit. Those co-benefits include jobs, and those jobs are distributed everywhere, all across this country, uh, and can build community resilience, build skills, increase capabilities, especially for the folks who need them the most. And there's tremendous healthcare co-benefits. If you are turning your thermostat down to 50 every winter because you can't afford to put food on the table when your SNAP benefits run out at the end of the month, uh, you're at much higher risk of contracting pneumonia or bronchitis or having an acute attack of COPD or asthma or cardiovascular events that are going to send you to the emergency room uh, and possibly bankrupt you. And since a lot of those folks are on Medicaid and Medicare, uh, it raises national health care costs. There's tremendous opportunity here to partner with healthcare providers and other help folks in the healthcare ecosystem to provide the capital and then share in some of the healthcare savings. There's so much opportunity here and it's not a space that's very crowded at the moment. People are focusing on other issues. Take a look at some of the companies out there. There's one I would recommend you look at called Block Power. It's doing this kind of thing, but there's so much more opportunity I think it's really a tremendous space for folks to get into and it will make a huge difference to our future. Thanks a lot. Wow, thank you so much, Professor Sturman. Thank you so much. So next we will have Professor Jacqueline Pless, who is the Fred, um, Fred Kane um, Career Development Professor of Entrepreneurship and an Assistant Professor in the Technolo Technological Innovation, Entrepreneurship and Strategic Management Group at the MIT Sloan School of Management. She is also a faculty affiliate of the MIT Center for Energy and Environmental Policy Research and Martin Trust Center for MIT Entrepreneurship as well as an honorary research associate with the University of Oxford. Her research interests are in developing a better understanding of how to drive innovation for social progress with a particular focus on clean energy innovation. Prior to joining MIT, Professor Pless held um, several positions with the National Renewable Energy Laboratory, the Smith School of Enterprise and the Environment at the University of Oxford and the World Bank, as well as the National Conference of State Legislatures. She has a PhD and MS in Mineral and Energy Economics from the Colorado School of Mines and a BA in Economics and Political Science from the University of Vermont. Professor Pless, what do you think is a major business opportunity for climate tech startups to tackle? Well, thank you so much um, for all of that. I really appreciate being here and, and learning from everybody else as well. And uh, thank you to John for setting the stage so well. Um, agree with everything that you said. And um, also we'll be ending with some thoughts on kind of the distributional cost consequences of everything. And by that, I mean, looking out for the poor and making sure that um, innovation is, is really driving uh, progress and social progress forward. Um, so in thinking about these, the business opportunities, um, I thought that I would structure my comments um, around basically two broad classes of startups or um, startups that are tackling different types of technologies, uh, and um, both of which that would contribute to accelerating decarbonization of the energy sector. Um, and each of these two different types of startups 
basically would entail different types of business strategies and come through different challenges as well. Um, so the first of, of those would be those that are a little bit more software oriented. So these are gonna be companies that are aiming to address things like how to better integrate renewable energy into the system, um, using data and analytics to improve operations, and essentially developing new software that'll help provide a better service. And then the second category would be those that are um, a little bit more hardware oriented. So those that are actually developing the technology, developing smart meters, developing um, more efficient solar panels and things of that nature. Um, and, and so each of these two different kind of classes of companies are gonna require different strategies to be successful. And they're gonna tackle different parts of kind of the innovation uh, cycle that we need to think about for energy. So on the kind of more IT software oriented side of things. Um, so these are gonna be companies that are really trying to address issues around integrating renewable energy into the system, um, conditional on there being uh, cost effective and, and reasonable uh, technologies to do so. Um, and so this would be something like, okay, you take a, um, given that there are renewable energy resources on the grid, um, if you think about smart meters, which are meters that can be in your homes, but they're also, they can be elsewhere. Um, and utilities and energy service providers and, um, and you in the household as well can essentially track data, track information about your energy use and improve decision-making, um, at least in theory. So in this uh, context, then a utility could possibly help identify system vulnerabilities, um, help improve their quality of service, reduce costs um, and possibly identify needs for investment. Um, and so, but what we need really on top of just the, the technology and the meters themselves is the actual data, the analytic, uh, analyzing the data in a way that can actually create some value um, for both the utility as well as customers. Um, and so a big part of what software uh, type of development and this more IT side of things um, can do is really about trying to help balance supply and demand on the grid. Um, and doing so is what's really uh, important in order to better exploit uh, clean energy resources. Um, so there's a lot of potential to create value there. Um, of course, you always have to think about the demand for these types of technologies or the demand for these services um, and get a sense of whether utilities are actually really willing to, to buy them, to invest in them. Uh, this is increasingly the case. Um, so much about the energy sector is actually about regulation and policy and tax incentives and subsidies. Um, and so even if utilities wouldn't necessarily um, adopt these things on their own, they're, they're kind of being forced to in a way. Um, but one thing that we can find kind of in uh, anecdotal evidence as well as some data is that a lot of these uh, utilities and service providers, they, they might have the meters or even have certain software um, services that are informing some decisions, um, but the data and the, the data is not being analyzed um, in a way that can really create a lot of uh, value. So they're not necessarily engaging with the technologies. And so I think going this route, um, it's, it's really going to require, well, first of all, paying a lot of attention to, to regulation and policy um, in terms of where you want to target these types of um, deployments of this technology. But also think about you know, what are some of the things that else that you can offer that could have a competitive advantage to create more value, things like offering training, um, uh, different types of forms of information that you can pro provide to service um, to those that are providing electricity so that they can use that information in a better um, and more efficient way. So one thing that's um, unique about uh, these software types, types of companies relative to other energy startups is that they do tend to look a little bit more like software companies instead of a typical kind of hardware uh, technology development um, type of startup. And so you might be familiar with basically the venture capital bloodbath of 2010-ish um, in the energy sector, where essentially venture capitalists invested a lot throughout the 2000s um, and then made no money. And a big part of this is that there are some really unique challenges um, to in energy innovation that you don't necessarily see in other, other sectors. So the, um, in terms of there being just extremely long time, time horizons before you make money, it really takes a long time to commercialize a technology. Um, you need a lot of high upfront capital investment to get started. Um, what's interesting about the more IT software oriented energy startups is that they, because they do look a little bit more like typical software companies, you might be able to attract kind of early stage investment a little bit faster. Um, and uh, that's, that's different than what it would mean to attract financing in an energy hardware type of company. Um, 
And so, and you just have to think about the need that you're going to have to generate returns within five years um, in order to, to kind of continue and survive and continue getting more finance. Um, and the other thing that's interesting about this type of company would be that a lot of the applications and the things that you develop and the software um, actually kind of transcends the, the energy sector. So it can be used in a lot of other sectors and industries um, and therefore your market just might be a little bit bigger. Um, this might be a little bit of a crowded space. I'm actually not really sure. Uh, what I can see in the data is that a lot of the, the VCs have been investing very heavily in these types of companies in the last um, five to seven years. So uh, competition is always something to think about. And then on the hardware side, so companies that are, um, or if you're really interested in like basic R&D and developing new technology and driving down the costs of existing technologies, um, massive needs still for this. So I think there's been a huge push on more of the IT side of things, but we really still do need cheaper forms of clean energy. We need electricity storage um, in order to get to a place where we're at net zero um, uh, carbon for the energy sector. Uh, and so this is gonna take a bit of a, a different strategy um, because in order to get started on this type of innovation and in R&D, you really need a ton of upfront large investments. This is not what um, venture capitalists are going to do. Uh, they're kind of moving a little bit more towards a spray and pray kind of model where they're distributing just smaller amounts to, to more projects. And so this is gonna mean looking for funding. Um, traditionally, it might be uh, kind of these large grants that might be given by the government. Um, but increasingly, we're seeing some new creative, different forms of um, funding that provide a little bit more patient capital um, for these things so that you have a little bit more time before you have to uh, actually make returns. And this is essentially just addressing a different kind of valley of death, we would call it. Um, and they're just different interesting funding models to look out for when you're trying to, um, to get started. Um, and so just, I guess, one last thing um, on the hardware side of things is that also what's really, I think, useful when you're trying to seek funding is to look out for, you know, whether it might be useful for you to partner with some other type of institution or to receive some type of mentorship as part of your commercialization and development. Um, there is a lot of value that, say, even your, your financers can offer in terms of really helping um, inform your, your decision making and then also just, you know, it might be that you could really leverage a lot of the technology and lab space at a big lab that you might not need to invest in yourself. So um, partnerships also can be complicated sometimes, so you have to be smart about it, but it's something worth considering. Um, business model innovation is also going to be really key. And this really ties to, I think, some of John's comments about how do we bring these technologies and low-cost energy um, to those that can't afford it, or how do we get to a place where we can actually provide clean and affordable energy to everybody in the world. Um, and this is where I think, you know, it's, it's gonna be largely about how do we continue to innovate to drive down the costs of these technologies, but different um, business models are going to work depending on the location, depending on the set of regulations, depending on everything that's unique. Um, and so thinking about business model innovation is also important. We haven't really gotten that right yet. Um, so this is just to say that I think both sets of uh, startups and, and innovation are needed and they're just different types of strategies and challenges that you will face along the way. Thanks. Thank you so much, Professor Pless. Uh, certainly an exciting time to, to be in the space given that there's, there's a patient capital for you know, tough tech uses, but um, also traditional venture capital for more capital light businesses. Uh, definitely an exciting time. Um, so next, we will hear from Tom Hunt, who is the Technology Scout and Early Pipeline Team Lead at X, the Moonshot Factory, a division of Google's parent company, Alphabet. X was created in 2010 to tackle some of the world's biggest challenges with the goal of generating 10x impact on the world's most intractable problems. Tom leads a program to source, evaluate, and pursue technology opportunities for X, and has been with Alphabet companies, including Google, for more than 11 years. He has more than a decade of experience consulting for startups in the clean tech, biomedical, and hard tech sectors. He has a PhD in physics from Harvard and a BS in physics from Stanford University. Tom, thanks for being here today. What do you think is a major business opportunity for climate tech startups to tackle? Well, in, these, in this era of uh, remote meetings, it's hard to keep things lively. And so I wanna do my best here. And so if you guys could prepare to type in some answers in the chat, hopefully we'll be able to share them around. What I wanna start off with is this one graph here. And I would love to hear what you think this is a graph of. So um, please type in the chat 
uh, and uh, Robert, you feel free to shout out answers. I want to hear what this graph might be. And panelists, also feel free to type in the chat what you think this might be a graph of. We got daily electricity use, the duck curve, annual CO2 emissions. Interesting. Up and down through the, uh, yeah, that's interesting. Those, unfortunately, are almost monotonically up. Um, we got S&P returns, cyclical, good, interesting. Renewables generation, tides, I love it. Lots of, uh, lots of, um, lots of cyclical things here. Uh, mood swings during COVID, love it. Um, also, perhaps a monotonically down uh, graph. Well, okay, I'll, I'll give you a little, uh, one more clue. Here we go, here's the next slide. All right, so this is an annual cycle. Peaks in the winter and troughs in the spring. Anybody? Energy use in homes? Good guess. Let's get two more. Net load minus renewables. In fact, very much correlated. We we have a winner here, uh, natural gas use. So there's the there's the axis, uh, billion cubic meters. And then tragically, we somebody also um, uh, tapped into net load minus renewables because in the northern hemisphere, of course, um, solar is much much more productive in the summer. Wind is typically productive in the spring and fall, and so this is actually anti-correlated. It's worse than a, da a daily duck curve because it's actually anti-correlated with um, with renewables production. It's also not electrified generally. But much of this is going into thermal load um, and or going into thermal demand. Um, and so because the uh, the part that's uh, natural gas for electricity generation is less um, um, is less uh, the part with natural gas for electricity generation is less correlated with the seasons. Um, so we basically have a double edged sword here, one of which is um, that we need to demand shit. Well, we're going to build a lot of renewables. Um, hopefully, Jacqueline's right, and uh, and smart grid startups can help those uh, those renewables penetrate the grid at very high percentages. But we need to have even more energy generation during the winter. And so people people think a lot about the duck curve and how do we uh, load shift um, from uh, you know from uh, load shift the renewables por um, production during the day, uh, perhaps to the evening, but we don't talk a lot about seasonal storage. And this is what the natural gas grid is doing for us is every year, um, and this is all the OECD countries. So this is every year we're drawing down this massive reserve um, at, about one, at about one terawatt. So if we think about, um, can we actually store it? Like to, to address the duck curve, you might build lithium ion batteries. You might look to pump hydro, but all the world's pumped hydro is 10 terawatt hours, and it only would displace this much. So if you if you you know take if you shave off the peak here with all of the world's pumped hydro and bring that over into the spring, it hardly makes a dent. Can you make 100x more pumped hydro? Like probably not. What about batteries? Well, we don't even have that many EVs or batteries today, but the that rate is increasing very quickly. And so in 2030, there should be about 100 million electric vehicles. We hope so. And that's also going to be all, all those batteries. If you drain, if you fill them up in the um, in the summer and drain them in the in the winter, you'd also only have about 10 terawatts or like this big visually of a of a chunk. So we can take two tiny bites out of this annual cycle. So what are some businesses? I want to I want to hand this over to the entrepreneurs again in the chat. What are some businesses that you can think of that would take advantage of? Um, the, this this uh, little discussed uh, dichotomy in annual energy demand for that's being met by natural gas right now. And actually, you might not be able to see me, and so I'm going to turn off the share. And um, let's hear from the audience a couple of business ideas. Yes, energy efficiency and thermal and envelope. Um, yeah, so I think a lot there on the demand side. We have two choices, right? Demand side and supply side. And that on the demand side, uh, John had the very first description of what I had too. And this and this person in the chat, uh, the uh, 
the building envelope is critical. Uh, so much is thermal heating in not just residential though, um, also commercial, industrial, and uh, and globally. So thinking about how to how to switch that over, um, and a lot of the things that John did in his own house. Can we electrify this? Can we go to uh, heat pumps that are much more efficient? Can we go to district heating um, that could uh, more efficiently heat larger areas? Electricity, chemical fuels, absolutely. Um, I think that's a huge one because like, you just aren't going to have electrochemical storage. Um, there, are, there are a few companies that think they might be able to get to very low cost electrochemical storage, but even that's probably week time scales instead of a year time scale. And um, can you use the same kind of storage mechanisms that we have today to store fo fossil fuels, whether that's hydrogen under the ground um, or in giant tanks, whether that's uh, liquid fuels? Um, and so I think that this is even more powerful from a startup perspective because you might be inspired by solving this problem, but if you can make very low cost um, hydrogen uh, from renewable sources, you would not only solve this problem, you solve a lot of other problems that, that are out there in terms of chemical production and, and many other things that can't be decarbonized. So that's pretty good. Yeah. Renewables in the Southern Hemisphere and the global transmission system. This is actually an interesting tidbit. Buck, Buckminster Fuller um, described of the famous like geodesic dome uh, fame uh, drew up a global uh, electric grid. Um, you might have to solve some political problems before you can practically implement that, but, but I do think it's pretty interesting. <clears throat> One more idea from the audience, and then I'll give you a couple more. Massive overbuilding and clean energy. Yes, and I think that's um, there. There's an opportunity that comes with that. So if you want to tr try to address this, you might have to do a two x overbuild in order to fit in order to fit kind of. Um, peak demand and uncertainty in uh, in summer season. But here, what we see is we'd actually need something like a 4X overbuild in order to get those uh, the winter demand, which means that you're going to have, if, if you chose that as a society, which uh, or if renewables were so cheap that that was a viable path forward, now you would have uh, enormous overcapacity of renewables. And that becomes now an enabling factor Right, where you can then say, okay, it's quite likely we'll overbuild renewables to address this problem and other problems. But what do we do with that idled capacity? Now we have essentially free electrons in the time that um, people aren't using that electricity. And so, because it's uh, there's no demand for it. And so that then enables your electrolysis or uh, electricity to liquid fuels. Um, so I think that, that thinking about that uh, market dynamic of flipping the electricity so that there's there's excess electricity, what do you do with that cheap electricity is a really interesting uh, way to think about startup opportunities. Um, I think the last one, is, I, I would just add renewable natural gas. Um, that is not price competitive. Natural gas comes for free out of the ground in Texas, but it's exciting because you could use all of this built infrastructure that's designed around the world to distribute all this gas. That gets to keep operating. And so could you ever um, could you inject hydrogen into natural gas pipelines at, at moderate concentrations? What would allow you to do that? Could you just, uh, you know, attach the carbon? Um, could you then separate the carbon so you don't actually combust the carbon and instead just combust the hydrogen? I think there's um, some really interesting opportunities there. So I'll, I'll end on a, on a cautionary note, which is one of the real challenges for a startup here is you only get paid once a year. <laughs> um, so the you know whatever capital you have you only get to discharge it once a year which means that it's a very very it's very hard to meet thermal demand with one of the cheapest fuels we have out there which is natural gas and only be able to do it once a year so the economics here are really critical um, and extremely difficult so um thanks thanks a lot to everybody i hope we can convince uh some of you to tackle this really challenging problem Thank you so much, Tom. This was really great hearing several of the ideas that you had and um, some of the challenges and opportunities there. Um, just a reminder for the audience, again, just to write to your questions in the chat so that we can um, get to them in the Q&A portion after our last panelist here. And so with that, um, I'd like to welcome our final panelist, who is Elizabeth Willett Murchison, who is a Sloney herself, class of 2008. As the Director of Strategic Initiatives at Walmart, Liz currently leads strategic efforts to innovate and drive community impact across the communities where Walmart operates. This encompasses 4,700 US stores within 10 miles of 90% of the US population. 
She ensures the company's efforts are directed to becoming a good force um, and helps push Walmart to be a sustainable company for communities for the communities that it serves. Prior to her role at Walmart, Liz has nearly two decades of experience delivering entrepreneurial based solutions to help organizations do good by doing well. She worked at the Schultz Family Foundation, Mercy Corps, Amazon, and Mars and Bay Science. Prior to coming to Sloan, she served as an officer in the US Army for 11 years. Liz, we are thrilled to have you today. What do you think is our major is a major business opportunity for climate tech startups to tackle? Uh, I think, thank you for the introduction. That was very kind. Uh, there are so many solutions and I'm gonna pause because I'm gonna frame it up a bit. Um, I think the panelists have outlined some really huge challenges and I would double down on all of those. Those are immediate, those are huge, huge opportunities. Um, I'm gonna take a little bit of a different lens, kind of a curse um, working for the world's largest grocer and um, kind of players, um, this idea of um, kind of in our sustainable ecosystems, um, nature loss, biodiversity. And I talked to you a little bit about um, donut economics, which I'm sure some of you realize, but using that lens to think about um, footprints and opportunities within things that impact that. Um, and so I'll save my kind of big three for the end to talk about what those goals might be. Um, but let me just share my screen here. Um, and I would, I'm also gonna say, it's just a real delight to be here. Um, I think it, you may know, I, I helped start the MIT Clean Energy Prize when it was Clean Energy Prize back in the day. So to be part of this as it's morphed into Climate Tech and Energy Prize, it's, it's great to see that transition go to where it should be. Um, and kudos to all of you in this journey because um, half the battle is just thinking about it and trying and failing fast and going faster because we need more people um, failing fast and tackling these really big sticky challenges. Um, so for those of you who may not be an economics major, I certainly am not, though I attended Sloan, so I feel like I get an honorary one, just kidding, um, that I, I, I've really been um, enthralled by this idea of donut economics. And I think it's a really good frame for us to think about um, climate tech solutions. Um, the theory amongst um, donut economics is fundamentally we have this ecological ceiling, um, which we can measure. Uh, these are the finite resources or the total pie of things that we have available as natural kind of resources or things that that limit us as, a, as an earth to survive. And so you have um, some measurements that happen within it to say, where are we on this ecological ceiling? Um, and then within that, there's kind of a social foundation because as we see, um, there are social imperatives for happy, healthy lives that maintain stability within that. And so there's kind of a social um, area and anything that doesn't meet that is a, a societal social um, foundation shortfall, um, which is kind of an area where I work and operate in. So it's things on like, as a human, you need water and food, um, you need social equity, political justice, education. Those are kind of the determinants that dis set, determines kind of sustainable societies but within it, you, it can't be at the cost of these other finite resources. And so it's the balance of when it, within that, that kind of determines where you have a safe, sustainable, safe and just world. And so the, this, the intersectionality of the two, I think there's a whole bunch of ways that climate tech can play within this. Um, and it can't just be at measuring one, it has to be moving toward regenerative goals, which you see our company leaning into and lots of other companies, that it's not enough to get to two degrees C to just think about that. You have to be in a regenerative mindset and mind frame. Um, so within that, where are the areas where we see that we've exceeded those planetary goals and where we really could be focusing? Um, climate change, we see that happening, like we're beyond the limits, like all the trajectories put us beyond two degrees C. So everything that we do at this point has to double down, triple down, and we need everybody focusing on that. But within that frame, we also have to simultaneously think about biodiversity loss and the nitrogen phosphorus loading that's happening within our oceans, which lead to acidification and overgrowth and other um, things. This will have a direct impact on our food that's sustainable, our social economic um, sustainability, migratory patterns, et cetera. And so I think that there, in my mind, there are three real issues kind of using a US market-based opportunity where folks can play. Um, I'm gonna illustrate it in kind of a, a Liz living example. Uh, I I'm used to live in Seattle and now I live in Bentonville, Arkansas. 
the resources that are available to me as a human within a socioeconomic perspective to be a responsible citizen in my society are limited based off of the taxation and the, the things that are available in our city to invest in to make those changes. In the area I live, we don't have, we have one mixed use recycling facility for the entire state. There's not a sustainable way for us to do that. Um, there's very low availability for me to go and buy anything other than kind of Walmart based type of seeds that are available for um, moving biodiversity into that area. So there, we're seeing um, a number of ways where people can't even garden in a sustainable way that um, doubles down on diversity. Also thinking about pollinators. So um, I think that within the three areas where I would focus and say there are major opportunities where companies like us um, and other major institutions have invested are areas where on climate change, biodiversity loss and nit nitrogen and phosphorus loading because it has a de direct um, correlation to our profitability around our major in indicator, which is food. Um, and so here are the three areas which I would say are the big, big areas, MRFs, mixed use recycle facilities. Currently mixed use recycle facilities um, are in very few locations in the country where they are um, they still don't tackle the entire use of, of plastics and recyclability there. Over two thirds of all items are, are recyclable, but most areas aren't recycling within misuse recycle facilities. If you talk to local legislators and others, it's because the cost to run and operate and invest and get that legislation across is so cost prohibitive for that area to invest in a misuse recycle facility that they don't do it. Further, it puts a taxation on the on locals like myself who want to recycle, there's not an, a capability for me to even go and use and invest and drop that off. So there's a tax burden. I actually have to invest in paying to have it go um, into other um, recycling locations. Um, and so I'd say, um, if you're thinking about neighborhoods where people are um, not making as much or areas that are economically depressed, that these are areas where you, you will never see these mixed use recycle facilities or recycling being invested in the communities and the major barrier is cost. So innovations in and around it, I think about two-way logistics um, that can provide affordability within an organization. So I think of models where you could have a box being dropped off from Walmart or Amazon or any other place, and then you could send it back through carriers to a mixed-use recycle facility that usurp that capability. And organizations who have invested into the sustainability goals may invest in that. Um, so I think that there are a number of things around recyclability and two-way logistics that could be invested. Um, fertilization, capture, and reuse. I think one of the um, winners in the previous year um, focused very much on how to create fertilizer that um, sequesters nitrogen versus uh, emits nitrogen. Um, I'm thinking about other ways um, to keep that runoff to have sustainable agriculture. Um, we're, it is you cannot grow food without fertilizer, but that fertilizer has these secondary effects um, that are detrimental to things like oceans and food wildlife. So focusing in those areas is also a big area of opportunity um, that both growers and end users are looking at from a biodiversity um, sustainability standpoint. Um, and then last, micro farming diversity solutions. Um, the, we hear a lot about the farm to table movement, but I think it, you're going to see um, in environments where people are looking for more um, individual sustainable consumer solutions to do micro farming. Um, everything from you've seen this thing called um, seed sheet where somebody you can order and say I want these seeds printed on a sheet printed where I as a consumer can use that to do micro farming. I think you can see things for pollination and others where you have consumer-based solutions that are highly profitable, um, where you see end consumers gravitating toward it, but also work toward um, climate tech and, and challenges. So um, I'd be interested in hearing, similar to Tom, uh, others who are, are looking at solutions around biodiversity uh, and this kind of idea of recyclability, um, preventing that bio, biodiversity um, declination um, where they're interested in focusing. So if you want to put in your chat. Or if anybody's considering it, I'd be happy to connect you with others um, in Walmart who are actively um, investing and thinking about this.
Great. Uh, thank you so much, Liz. I'd add that biodiversity in ag tech generally is a big reason we actually changed our name uh, to that way, uh, Clean Energy Prize. Um, there was some debate, but we, we didn't want to exclude folks interested specifically in ag tech. Um, so yeah, thank you all so much. Uh, Liz, Tom, Professor Pless, Professor Sturman for, for your incredible insights. Uh, we're so appreciative of your time tonight, but, but also your work and research broadly uh, that inspires us all to be better members of our communities, uh, global and otherwise. So our audience has some great questions for you, but before we open it up, uh, would any of you like to comment on, on anything that's been said or, or expand on some of your own comments? And no pressure. Good, let's hear from the folks out there. Okay, great. And I did see uh, Professor Sturman that you answered some questions already, which is great. Uh, so I'll go straight to the remaining open question from Will Sawyer. Uh, this is directed to Tom Hunt. Um, so Tom, instead of trying to solve this annual cycle from the supply side, could demand be changed? For example, focusing on high thermal businesses like ore processes or glass making and how to run those operations seasonally. Maybe it's cheaper to overbuild this infrastructure than the generation capacity. Yeah, I think that's a really interesting in, insight and is also relevant to electrification of industry where maybe if you have a glass factory, uh, it was natural gas fired until now, maybe if renew, maybe you could come up with an ultra low capex glass factory that could operate in half the year. Actually, maybe it's natural gas fired half the year and uh, electrical half the year. Uh, I think there are a lot of opportunities for both electrifying industry and for um, making very low capital expense industry that you can turn on and off dynamically, which actually even comes back to some of Jacqueline's ideas about smart grid and how you could have real time power pricing. And if you had an industrial process, some processes don't like being turned on and off because they're high temperature, but some processes are okay to turn on and off. Yeah, can I just build on Tom's answer there real quick? Um, so everything you just suggested, Tom, is, is really worth looking at, but uh, Demand moderation, including over the seasonal cycle, is a huge opportunity, and it is by far the cheapest, fastest, safest way to do this. Uh, so just very quickly, you know, when my original house here, if you turn the heat off in the winter, you were cold in half an hour because it was so leaky. Now, if you turn the heat off, you don't even notice it for 6 to 12 hours. That means that I've created... Um, storage at no cost to the electric utility. Now, that's not... Um, seasonal storage, but it really shaves a lot off the peaks. And if you combine that kind of thing with ground source heat pumps, you can really shave the peak at very low cost. Yeah, and I can just build on all of this a little bit more if we have a moment. Um, I totally agree with both Tom and John's uh, comments and uh, not to counteract my own comments all that much, but I, demand response and getting people to change behavior, uh, this is all extremely important, but it's definitely not going to solve the problem. It just needs to be part of the puzzle. Um, a lot of, you know, there's been a lot of recent research in some in economists and the economic literature showing that, you know, people just, demand is very inelastic, meaning they don't change demand all that much in response to price. Um, even, you know, all of us are super engaged, but uh, so we might adjust a little bit, but how much, you know, it, it really is about, okay, how much can we shave that peak? And, and if the right pricing is, is in play, maybe that happens a little bit. Um, but without things like, like, I don't know, storage or something else to really complement that solution, um, you know, we, we really need both. Um, and I would you know, personally say that overbuilding anything is not a, gr a great solution, but um, we might need to overbuild uh, something. I just... Um, even real-time pricing. So I actually have a new paper that looks exactly at real-time pricing and uh, people just aren't responsive. So um, there's a lot of work to be done. So I totally right. People aren't gonna be that responsive. You build the real-time pricing response into the thermostat with a $10 chip. So it's all automatic once the house is tight enough for it to make a difference. And then people don't have to worry about it. There's nothing for them to do. And on the overbuilding story, I'm not a huge fan of uh, CDR, carbon dioxide removal technologies like direct air capture, but uh, because it's better to prevent the creation of a defect than to try to fix it after it's in the hands of the customer, just think GM ignition switches or any number of other disasters. However, if you overbuilt the renewable generation capacity enough to really solve the load problem that Tom pointed out, after all these other things are, are done, then you can use that excess power in the, in the warmer weather to run your DAC machines, which are 
thermodynamically not favored otherwise, but if you had excess power, you could do it and start sucking some CO2 out of the atmosphere at very low marginal cost. Great, thank you all for the, uh, the team effort addressing that one. Um, so we have a question for Elizabeth now. Uh, so Liz, as someone closely connected with food production and distribution, have you noticed any promising solutions to limiting waste of food and in what direction do you think society and I suppose uh, uh, aspiring entrepreneurs should head to counteract that waste? Um, I think food waste happens at every juncture. Um, it happens at production, it happens at um, acquisition, distribution, and then in the home. Um, I think once you get down to the in-home le level, you still have about a third of total food that's purchased it um, goes to waste. And if you go down the, like the funnel, you know, it happens here and it widens, but if you're still talking about a third of food waste at the end um, in home still goes to waste, that's a lot. Um, and when you think about everything, some would say, oh, well, if it's fresh food um, or if it's, you know, some has some organic nature, then we can compost it. But the reality is, as we, we talked with like MRFs, uh, if you think there's problems with MRFs, there's even further problems with composting um, you know, we think about two thirds of total production of um, compostable products are never composted, they go into landfill. Um, so we think about it, as we think about all the levels of it, I think there's capacity for measurement, there's capacity for transparency, um, diversion, there's opportunities to integrate with um, national networks like Feeding America to provide more transparency on demand loads and when those things can be absorbed into food banks um, so I think that there are a number of technologies along that waste cycle that can be um, examined. Great, thank you. And, and we'll roll right into the next one for you. And that's how do startups trying to solve some of the problems that, that you mentioned and others mentioned uh, work with large organizations like Walmart? Um, so there, there are a number of ways, I think, um, and I'll allow each organization to speak. I think um, there are business development people, there are people who are actively going out and seeking conferences and technology from their, business, their own internal business development. Um, we have our own kind of incubator, it's called Open Call. It takes place every year. It's um, kind of a shark tank for Walmart where we um, allow entrepreneurs to come in and pitch their ideas and their technologies um, that are ready to be consumer-based in front of us. We're considering how do we think about that from a climate tech perspective as well. Um, and then if, it, if there are um, technologies that are of interest, whether it's refrigeration or technology, uh, you know, anything that re relays into Walmart operations, I'd personally be happy to make connections where I have them or introduce. Um, I, I can never promise anything more than that. Um, but I would just say the best thing you can do is use your network and be really honest about your goals and be um, transparent about what you want. Just ask, 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 because um, I think part of the challenge for all of us who are seeking out these solutions is finding those golden nuggets and then finding them when they're at a scalable solution so somebody like us can absorb. So um, partnering with other organizations, don't be afraid to partner and scale and, and move with others um, in order to pitch to an organization like Walmart. But I'd say um, the other piece is get quick wins with other smaller organizations because the more you have... Um, partnerships with smaller organizations where you can have your proof of concept and scale then an organization who's as big as Walmart or some of these others, um, we can then consider about how we scale you internally. Um, I think that's one of the biggest challenges is people wanna go right after a Walmart size scale immediately when you haven't proven your concept. Um, an organization like Walmart could crush you and <laughs> um, could crush your scalability plans very immediately and you may not be prepared I think if you can go to some of the smaller organizations and have your proof of concept and then be prepared to, to move out, that's um, oftentimes a better strategy for an early stage organization. I don't know, Tom, maybe you. you have some, um, some experience with that with X as well. Yeah, I, I think that was really good insight, Elizabeth. And I think there's a couple of things I'd add. First, try not to partner, like it can be tempting to partner with the R&D division and Entre exactly, yeah, entrepreneur, like first time entrepreneurs may do that, but you really wanna partner with a product organization to be sure that you're solving a 
an actual problem for the company's bottom line because that's what's going to get you that traction. And I like your idea a lot about uh, going to the mid-sized organizations first because not only uh, not only is it difficult to work with, and there's a lot of overhead associated with working with giant organizations, but we also move slowly compared to a medium-sized organization. So um, that would be my advice as well. Great, yeah, great question and, and very helpful answers. Thank you very much. Um, so I was actually chatted one and it's a little more profound in scope. And, and since we're running up on time, um, this is for all the panelists and uh, hopefully produces some interesting insights. So uh, question for the panelists, how do you respond to people who say things aren't as bad as they seem? So those who would say that we're actually using less now because we're more efficient at building things. Uh, for example, we have one phone versus a scanner, a phone, a camera, et cetera. Um, I guess the question is how, how does, to what degree does that offset um, that, you know, improved efficiency in, in manufacturing offset um, waste in other places. Um, I could take a quick shot at that. So first of all, all those efficiency improvements are enormously important. The um, carbon intensity of the economy has been falling at or the energy intensity of the global economy has been falling at one, one and a quarter percent per year for a long time. If it didn't, and that's the result of efficiency, a shift to a post-industrial economy in many places and so on. But if that wasn't happening, greenhouse gas emissions would be so much higher, we'd already be in much, much worse trouble, possibly cross irreversible tipping points. So we hope very much that that trend will continue. But there are some thermodynamic limits there. And even more important, as people save money by that kind of efficiency improvement, it leads to what's called the indirect rebound effect, which is I've got more money in my pocket because I'm spending less on energy because my iPhone uses so much less than all those other devices it replaced. So what do I do with that? Well, we spend it or we invest it and other people spend it and that drives an increase in energy demand and greenhouse gas emissions. So we desperately need all the efficiency improvements and technological benefits we can muster and it's never gonna be enough no matter how good it is because if we just use the savings to increase the scope and scale of global consumption, that's a trap we can never escape from. The thing that I'd add to that is we don't have to reduce emissions. We have to go to zero. In fact, we have to go to negative emissions. And so like all the efficiency in the world doesn't get you to zero. We, we need some real systems level changes. Right. Great. Uh, I guess I'll turn it over to Sue Smitha now to close this out. Perfect. Thank you so much to all the panelists. This was an incredible discussion and, you know, we'd love to have this conversation go on and on. Um, and everyone that attended, thank you so much for attending and for all your questions. Um, so just as a reminder, we'd like to just share that the applications are still open and you can find the link through the QR code on the screen right now, as well as on our website. Uh, you have until February 5th, 2021 to submit your application. We'll announce semifinalists and mentors on March 1st. And looking ahead, April 8th will be our semifinals and April 15th will be our final pitch day. A link to the webinar will be available on our website um, if you want to rewatch. And please do follow us on social media. We have a Slack community, Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn. And if you have any questions, do not um, hesitate to reach out to us at ceprize at mit.edu. So again, I'd like to thank, thank all the panelists once again for all their time here. Um, and that's it. Thank you to the entrepreneurs who are trying to tackle these big challenges. We need more of you. You're here. Keep up the good work. Bye, everyone. Good meeting you. Bye-bye, folks. Thank you. Thank you, panelists. Bye.